Okay, so basically, um, when we talk about mechanism of labor, which we will talk about in the end, we basically have two things which we talk about. We have the passage, which is the pelvis. The maternal pelvis is the passage. Okay, and the passenger is the fetus. Okay, so we need to understand, and in most of the times, it is the head which is presenting so the head passes through the pelvis so we have to and the head is very is a bony structure so two bony structures the passenger and the passage and the, what is the third key which helps in the process of labor is power so we have the passenger we have the passage and we have uterine contractions that is the power and this enables a, a, a vaginal delivery to happen now to understand what happens in, so is this clear is the can you all see the pelvis uh, let me know if it's not visible okay so this is the pelvis we'll first talk about the pelvis then we'll talk about this important points in the skull and important definitions okay thank you Kruti. and then we will talk about mechanism of labor in the most common position okay so i won't deal with mal positions mal presentations in this video we can keep it for another later time we will discuss mainly uh, uh mechanism of labor in the most common position and we'll discuss that towards the end first let us start with a simple thing that is the pelvis now this is the maternal pelvis okay and what you need to know about this pelvis i will just focus on important points i won't go into too much detail because that is all given in the books. I will tell you what you need to know for your exam point of view, what you need to know to understand the process of labor. Okay, so the pelvis is made of two innominate bones, that is the two iliac uh, bones, the hip bones, you have the sacrum and the coccyx. Okay, so these four bones is what forms the pelvis. Okay, and the pelvis is divided into a false pelvis and a true pelvis. So false pelvis is basically formed by the iliac crests the anterior abdominal wall and the spine posteriorly and the false pelvis doesn't have much role because we will be discussing the true pelvis the true pelvis is the actual bony part through which the fetus has to descend down because it is bony it is has limited space and won't doesn't have much of give weight what is there is there the fetus has to pass through this there is no compromising it so whatever space is there the fetus has to somehow negotiate its way down okay so that's why the true pelvis the pelvis which is actually inside is important now if we talk about true pelvis we have three important parts of the true pelvis we have the inlet we have the cavity inside and we have the outlet. So for easy understanding, we divide the pelvis into an inlet, into a cavity and an outlet. Okay, now this is very important to understand why have we divided this? Because remember, the pelvis is not a cylinder. Okay, if it was a cylinder, then that means all the diameters are the same throughout, then there would have not been an, been an issue. But the pelvis is in such a way that the inlet is like a transverse oval okay and the outlet is a vertical oval okay and the cavity is somewhat circular so basically the cavity is the pelvis is changing from a transverse oval to a vertical oval and hence um, let me just see if this works uh, the whiteboard one second okay so i think i'll write and show you let me know if this is seen okay so what happens this is the inlet okay so you can see here at the inlet the transverse diameter is larger than the anterior posterior diameter this is the inlet okay what happens later on in the cavity the cavity becomes somewhat of a circle and the outlet becomes like this that means the vertical diameter is more than the transverse diameter so this fetus also has to juggle its way in such a way that initially its diameters are fitting in the maximum transverse diameter and then later on it will turn so that the diameters fit into the larger anterior posterior diameter so the shape is such that the fetus has to juggle its way through okay so coming back to the let's talk about the inlet so the inlet i said is a transverse oval that means the transverse diameter is the largest diameter okay the anterior posterior diameter is the smaller diameter and we have the oblique diameters which are 
the left oblique or the right oblique okay so that the transverse diameter here at the inlet is 13 centimeter okay remember 13 oblique 12 and ap is 11 so easy to remember 11 12 oblique and 13 is the transverse diameter this makes it much easier okay so this changes at the outlet to the opposite. At the outlet, the AP diameter is around 12 to 13 centimeter and the transverse diameter is around 11 centimeter. Okay, so this completely changes from a vertical, from a transverse oval to a vertical oval. That's the first important point you need to understand. Okay, now also remember at the inlet, I just said the AP is 11 centimeter, but remember there are three anterior posterior diameters at the inlet. Okay, what are these three anterior posterior diameters at the inlet? Now, if you look at the inlet, okay, the, the posterior part is the sacral promontory, but anteriorly, okay, there are three points from which we can measure the inlet. From the top of the pubic symphysis, from the inner part of the pubic symphysis, the part jutting, or from the lower part of the pubic symphysis, which we actually measure when we do a PV examination. So when we do a vaginal examination of a woman in labor or of a woman at term, we try to determine the anterior posterior diameter. How do we do that? So when I'm doing a PV, I put two fingers inside and I feel the sacral promontory, okay? So from the bottom part of the pubic symphysis till the sacral promontory, okay, this is what is called the diagonal conjugate. Okay, so the diagonal conjugate is basically this. This is what I can measure, okay? Now, this will be around 12 centimeters, okay? Now, if I subtract 1.5 centimeters from the diagonal conjugate, I get what is called the obstetric conjugate. And what is the obstetric conjugate? It is from, again, the sacral promontory to the midpoint of the pubic symphysis. And this is the actual diameter which the pel, which the skull is going to traverse, okay? Because it is the actual measurement, okay, of the bony prominences. And this is called the obstetric conjugate, which is, 1.5 centimeter less from the diagonal conjugate. So it's around 10.5 or 11 centimeters. Okay, remember I said AP is 11, diagonal is 12, and transverse is 13. That's so around 10.5 to 11 centimeter. And the third diameter, this one, okay, from the sacral promontory till the top of the pubic symphysis is called the anatomical conjugate. And this has no, no significance in <coughs> obstetrics. It's just named because this is, it is a diameter. Okay, so I hope this is clear. The inlet is clear. I will repeat. We have a transverse diameter. Yes, this sum is asking, will this video be available on YouTube? Yes, it's being recorded and it will be available on YouTube. All right. So, again, it's a transverse over the inlet, 13 centimeter. Then we have a diagonal conjugate. And we have three AP diameters. The diagonal conjugate which we actually measure if we subtract 1.5 we get the obstetric conjugate is which is what actually the fetus passes through and the top one is the anatomical or the true conjugate <clears throat> now if we go lower down we encounter the cavity now the cavity has two planes the first is the plane of greatest dimension which is at a level of s2 s3 <clears throat> and the second is the plane of least dimension, which is at the level of the ischial spines. Can you see these? These prominences jutting inside, these are the ischial spines. Okay, so now the plane of greatest dimension, that is at the level of S2, S3, is the largest part of the pelvis. So the plane of greatest dimension is the largest part of the pelvis. <clears throat> and it is circular. That means the transverse and the AP diameters are the same, around 12.5 to 13 centimeters. Okay. Somebody is asking a doubt. Okay, clear. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the plane of the least dimension, that is the second part of the cavity at the level of the ischial spine, is the smallest part of the entire pelvis. It, it is at a level of S3, S4. Okay, and here is the most important plane because at this plane, the plane of least dimension is where most problems in labor happen. Here you have the transverse diameter, which is the interspinous diameter. That is the diameter between the two ischial spines. 
and this diameter is around 10 to 10.5 centimeters you can remember 10 centimeters and it has it is at this plane where a lot of things in the mechanism of labor happen for example internal rotation happens at this plane okay <clears throat> this is also the plane where when you do a pv this is where we mark it as zero station if the head has reached here it is zero station it is also the plane where deep transverse arrest happens so several important things happen at this plane it is the plane of least pelvic dimension because it is the smallest plane in the entire pelvis okay so plane of least pelvic dimension is at the level of the ischial spine very important to remember now the last is the outlet now the outlet is basically like a triangle like a diamond okay so i'll just show it to you how we would depict this one second okay so the outlet is like this okay here you have the pubic symphysis in front here you have the ischial tuberosities on either sides and here you have the coccyx behind or the sacrococcygeal joint because what happens during labor the head pushes the coccyx behind and what the actually what the fetus will negotiate through is the sacrococcygeal joint so here you can see it is an anterior posterior oval the ap diameter is much larger than the bituberous diameter so you can see it's formed by two triangles one triangle is the anterior triangle here okay and you have a posterior triangle at the back okay so this is how the outlet looks like you have it has it is basically formed by two triangles with the pubic symphysis anteriorly the sacrococcygeal joint posteriorly and these are the ischial tuberosities these okay here what you need to know is there something called the subpubic angle okay can you see this angle here this is the subpubic angle okay and it is wide in gynecoid pelvises now this is this uh, this is a new term gynecoid pelvis so there are different types of pelvis and for labor to happen normally most women will have more than 50 percent women will have what is called a gynecoid pelvis that is a female shaped pelvis and in a gynecoid pelvis the pubic symphysis the subpubic angle is wide okay now an android pelvis that is a male type of pelvis has a very narrow subpubic angle okay and that can cause cause problems also an android pelvis will have prominent ischial spine so the plane of least cavity which is anywhere very small becomes smaller in an android pelvis also in an android pelvis you'll have a very prominent sacral promontory so the inlet is heart shaped because the promontory is jutting inside and you'll have problems in engagement also because the it's just the, tip, the sacral promontory is jutting inside and the, this is again constricting the diameters so you'll have problems everywhere but more prominently at the ischial spines okay because they are very very prominent okay so this is about a gynecoid pelvis the important things that you need to know okay now another thing which we need to other there are other two types of pelvises one is an anthropoid pelvis or an ape like pelvis and a platypaloid pelvis now what you need to remember about this is as i said gynecoid pelvises are the most common android pelvis is a male pelvis where you will commonly encounter cephalopelvic disproportion you will encounter uh, uh, difficult prog uh, slow progress of labors you will encounter deep transverse arrest okay anthropoid pelvises are commonly associated with occipital posterior position what is an anthropoid pelvis i told you the inlet is a vert is a transverse oval but an anthropoid pel pelvis you'll find the inlet is a vertical oval okay so more than the, the ap diameters become larger at the inlet in a anthropoid pelvis so it is commonly associated with occipital posterior positions and deflection of the head a platypaloid pelvis is a flat pelvis you will have the transverse diameters and larger throughout okay so it's a transversely elongated pelvis and it is commonly associated with difficult engagements and asyncretism which we will discuss as we go further also important to know when you are asked about the pelvis is you may ask how do you perform a pelvic assessment now what is a pelvic assessment pelvic assessment basically means seeing whether the pelvis is adequate or not on a clinical examination 
And when do we do this? We usually do this in a term pregnancy. If the primary gravida is there, we usually do it around 38 to 40, any time, anywhere between 38 to 40 weeks, or when a woman goes into labor. We when we're doing a uh, assessment of the cervix and the cervical findings and seeing the bishop score, we also do a pelvic assessment. That is, we assess to see how adequate the pelvis is. So how do we clinically assess all that I've told you? How do we clinically assess this? We basically want to see whether it is a gynecoid pelvis or there are any problems constricting the, the uh, part of, parts of the pelvis. So the first thing we do is we look for the prominence of the sacral promontory, okay? Normally, I said we look for the diagonal conjugate that is 12 centimeters. But actually, if you if you examine a, a woman with a good gynecoid pelvis, you will not even be able to reach the sacral promontory unless you have very long fingers. Okay, so you're not able to reach the sacral promontory is a very good sign. That means your obstetric conjugate is adequate. That means your inlet is good. Another thing we do is we run our hand, our fingers down the sacrum, okay, from up to down and laterally. In a gynecoid pelvis, the sacrum should be well curved, both from up to down and laterally. An android pelvis will be a flat pelvis, okay? It won't have a very good curve. The third thing we do is we try to, we open our fingers and we try to reach for the pelvic side walls at the same time. In a gynecoid pelvis, we won't be able to reach the pelvic side walls at the same time. That means this is a roomy cavity, okay? That means the side walls are parallel. If the side walls are converging, like in an android pelvis, we'll be able to feel the pelvic side walls at the same time. Next, what do we look for? We look for the ischial spines. That is how prominent they are. When I'm doing a PV, I can feel these ischial spines jutting inside. I should not feel them prominently. If they're prominent, that means it's an android pelvis and it can cause trouble. Okay, then what do I do? I bring my fingers outside and I look for the subcubic angle. It should be obtuse. It should not be too narrow. And then I form a knuckle with my fist and I put my knuckle here and I see how, I see whether the knuckle is able to fit into the ischial tuberosity or not. So my four knuckles, if they're fitting between the two ischial tuberosities, I should be, it is, it is, that means it's a well, it's a nice, good pelvis, the outlet is good. But if less than four knuckles fit, that means the outlet is constricted. Okay, so that's how you do a pelvic assessment. I'll repeat, you look for the prominence of the sacral promontory, look for the curve of the sacrum, up to down and side to side. Look whether you can reach the pelvic side walls nicely together or whether they're converging. Look for the prominence of the ischial spines Look for the subpubic angle. Two fingers should nicely be able to go in the subpubic angle. And then do, look for the four knuckles entering the bituberous diameter. Okay, so that's how you assess the pelvis. Some questions are there. Uh, are you holding an android pelvis because you're able to touch? Okay, so this pelvis is actually, it, it's a mixed variation. I was just realizing this myself. This has a good inlet, a good outlet. But yes, you're right, the ischial spines are very prominent. I'm able to touch the pelvic side walls and the, the spines are prominent. This is sort of a mixed pelvis, it's not actually a real pelvis also. It's a dummy pelvis. Okay, so uh, you are right. You uh, realize that the ischial spines are prominent, very good. So it has sort of a male uh, android predominance in the cavity, the pelvis that I'm holding. Okay, so this is about the pelvis and what you need to know. So just... Very simple, inlet is a transverse oval, outlet is an AP oval. Uh, that's why the fetus has to undergo those different maneuvers for it to deliver. Okay, now coming to the fetus. This is the fetus. Okay, again, this is a dummy, it's not a real fetal skull. Okay, so what are the important points that you need to know of the fetus? Okay, the important points you need to know of the fetus are that there, there are several sutures which you should know, okay? The suture right in the middle here is the, between the two parietal bones, is the sagittal suture, okay? From the anterior fontanelle till the posterior fontanelle. Now, remember, anterior fontanelle here is a diamond-shaped fontanelle. What are fontanelle? They are meeting points of suture lines. The anterior fontanelle is a meeting point of four suture lines. The frontal suture 
in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, front part the sagittal suture posteriorly and the two coronal sutures on the sides they need to form a diamond shaped structure which is called the anterior fontanelle it's also called the bregma now remember the anterior fontanelle if is 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 a membrana structure it fuses much after birth several months after birth okay uh, and the uh, posterior fontanelle is basically formed by the meeting point of three suture lines okay that is the lambdoid sutures here on the side and the sagittal suture here so it's a triangle because it's formed by the meeting point of three suture lines okay and how do these fontanelle help us when we're doing a pva examination remember it's a we're not seeing we're just feeling so when we feel the anterior fontanelle okay what does that mean if i'm able to do when i'm doing a pva if i'm able to feel the anterior fontanelle i am feeling a diamond shaped structure what does that mean anyone what does that mean so I'm, I'm doing a pv i'm able to feel as against i'm able to feel the posterior fontanelle what's the difference can you see here i'm able to feel the anterior fontanelle and see how the head has changed here i'm able to feel the posterior fontanelle so if i'm yes very good sushmita head is not flexed so if i'm not able to feel the anterior fontanelle okay if i'm not able to feel the anterior i'm feeling the posterior font that means the head is flexed the body is here okay the body is up the head is coming like this okay that means the head is flexed in a deflexed head which is common in occipital posterior positions i am able to feel the anterior fontanelle so feeling the fontanelle is very very important just give me a second Okay, so this is why it's important to know the fontanelle. Of course, the fontanelle have other importance also, but from the point of view of mechanism of labor, we should be able to identify from the shape the what fontanelle we are feeling, mainly because we can tell whether the head is flexed like this or deflexed like this. Okay, now uh, uh, other important points of the skull are the face. Okay, this is the face. Okay. this part is the face this part is the frontum or the sinciput okay the frontum or the sinciput is basically from the anterior fontanelle till the glabella here the meeting point between the two or bital ridges this part is called the frontum or the sinciput or opposite the sinciput is the occiput okay so exactly opposite is the occiput occiput is the prominent part at the back of the head and this entire part which i'm holding this this part this is called the vertex right from the anterior fontanelle till the posterior fontanelle and including the parietal bones this is called the vertex of the head okay so these are the important points you need to know in the <coughs> fetal head now coming to diameters of this head important diameters you need to know is number 1 there are in the head there are basically two types of diameters one is the transverse diameter these are the transverse diameters okay and the most common transverse the most important transverse diameter you need to know is the biparietal diameter so you have two parietal eminences this is the largest transverse diameter in the fetus okay and that's why we need to know it because we need to know the largest diameter passing through the pelvis and that is the biparietal diameter which is 9.5 cm okay the other diameters are the anterior posterior diameters okay the ap diameters are these ones can you see my thumb and finger holding these are the ap diameters this one this one okay and these are what change and they change depending on what so the transverse diameter remains fixed okay the transverse diameter remains fixed that is the bpd remains fixed but what changes depending on the amount of flexion or extension is the ap diameter or the anterior posterior diameter is this clear is this point clear so the bpd the biparietal diameter remains fixed but what changes are the anterior posterior diameters just a second anu is wanting to say hello say hello please no okay mama take the class say bye bye sorry 
Okay, so this is the biparietal diameter here, and these are the anterior posterior diameters, which keep changing depending on flexion or extension of the fetal head. Okay, now coming to what are the different anterior posterior diameters? Okay, so now if the head is well flexed, okay, so this is the body of the fetus, okay, and well flexed means the chin of the head, fetus is touching the thorax like this, okay. So the chin is touching the body of the fetus, it is a well flexed head, okay. In a well flexed head, the presenting diameter, so the diameters which are the AP diameters are called the presenting diameters. The transverse diameter is called the engaging diameter. That is a diameter which happens during engagement, which we will talk about. Okay. So the presenting diameter in a well-flexed head is a sub. Anyone can tell me what is the presenting diameter in a well-flexed head? I'll wait for a few seconds. Yes, it is sob. Suboccipitobregmatic. Okay, suboccipitobregmatic is from the bregma to the occiput. This between, if you draw a line between my finger and my thumb, this is the suboccipitobregmatic diameter. How do you remember, remember this? If my head is well flexed, I'm crying. Okay, it's like I'm crying. Crying means sobbing. Sobbing is SOB suboccipitobregmatic. Easy way to remember. And because it's a well flexed head, it is the smallest diameter. Okay, remember flexion is a very good thing. The head should be flexed for a normal delivery. So good flexion, it has to be small. So it's 9.5 centimeters, same as the transverse diameter. So now well flexed head, the fetus is like a circle. Okay, and it nicely goes through the pelvis because the transverse diameter is also 9.5. The AP diameter is also 9.5. So it's like a nice little circle and it's able to enter the pelvis very nicely. Okay, and how do you remember this? Well flexed head, so the, the fetus is sobbing or crying or sobbing. So SOB suboccipitobregmatic. And it is the best diameter because it's the smallest diameter. So it's 9.5 centimeters. Okay. Now imagine the head is like this. Okay. This is a D flexed head. Can you see? It is straight, like how I'm teaching you right now. My head is neither flexed nor extended, it's straight. Okay. So this is the diameter which is presenting this diameter. Can you see between my finger and my thumb? Okay, this diameter is this attitude, this, this attitude of deflection is also called a military attitude. Like in the military, the army, the soldiers are standing straight. Okay, so it's called a military attitude, and this is the diameter. So it's the it's it is the occipital frontal diameter from the occiput to the front is is occipital frontal or a sub occipital front frontal depending on the amount of deflection okay but for simple terms remember occipital frontal remember it is around 11 centimeter 11.5 centimeters this is the occipital frontal diameter how do you remember this of of is office in the office everybody is looking straight ahead at their laptops right so occipital frontal which is slightly more than a well flexed head so deflection is not a good thing. With good uterine contractions, flexion should happen. Okay, so most babies with good uterine contractions will undergo flexion. Okay, so this is a deflexed head, office position, occipital frontal. This is 11 centimeters. The third diameter is now see what's happened. So well flexed head, deflexed head. Now what has happened? This is a, an attitude of partial extension. Okay, that means the head is now something like this. See my head, it's like this. So initially it was like this, then this, and now partial extension. Now in partial extension, you can see this is the part which is, or the frontum is what is now pointing downwards. Okay, and the diameter that is the, that is presenting here is from, so if this is the extension, extended head, so this was flexion, deflection, and now like this, can you see? This large diameter is now presenting down. So this is the presenting diameter. This is from the vertex till the mentum. What is mentum? It is the chin. This is the vertico-mental diameter, okay, which is the largest AP diameter, which is around 14 centimeters, okay? So the vertico-mental diameter is 14 centimeters. It is the largest AP diameter. Now, when we discussed the pelvis, was there any diameter which was 14 centimeter? No. So there was no diameter which was 14 centimeters. So in no way, if this is the attitude of the fetus, 
this fetus cannot enter the pelvis because the largest diameters we talked about were 13 centimeters. How can a 14 centimeter enter 13 centimeters? It can't. So this, this is called a, a, a bro presentation where the head is partially extended and a bro presentation does not have any mechanism of labor because in no way a, a, such a large diameter of the fetus can enter in any of the diameters of the pelvis. Okay, now coming to the last uh, attitude. This is a complete extension. So from complete flexion, then deflection. So complete flexion, deflection, partial extension, and now complete extension. The body is here, okay? So the head is entering like this now. This is called a face presentation where the attitude is complete extension. And this is the AP diameter presenting. Remember the transverse diameter remains the same. This is the diameter which is presenting. What is this diameter? This is the diameter in face presentation. This is from the mentum till the bregma. See where my fingers are? So it's a sub mento bregmatic or a mento bregmatic diameter. And remember, this is also a small diameter. It is 9.5 centimeters. So what are the three 9.5 centimeter diameters we talked about in the fetus? Anyone can tell me quickly? SOB, very good, Kruti. Then, so sub occipital pragmatic, sub mento pragmatic, and the biparietal. Very good, Sushmita. So, biparietal, sub occipital pragmatic, sub mento pragmatic, all are 9.5 centimeters. Remember this 9.5 centimeter, these are the three diameters. Now, tell me if a head is fully flexed and if a head is fully extended, what advantage does a fully extended head have over a fully, sorry, what, what advantage does a fully flexed head? have over a fully extended head everything else being the same i will expect a head which is fully flexed to deliver rather than a, rather than one which is fully extended to deliver even though the diameters are the same what phenomena does not happen in face presentation which will happen if the head is fully flexed anyone So if the head is fully flexed, yes, molding, very good. So if the head is fully flexed, can you see the suture lines? These are not fused. There's a phenomena called molding, which happens because of contractions. The space is very constricted. The bones, the bones come closer and closer together. This is called as molding. And sometimes they even overlap the suture lines. The bones can overlap. And this phenomena is called molding. This reduces the diameters to a further four millimeters. So 9.5 sub occipital pragmatic will actually become 9.1. It will reduce further by four millimeters. So even if the pelvis is not very good, but the head is very well flexed, she will deliver. As against a face presentation where the facial bones, remember, are fused at term. There is no molding happening here. So if the pelvis is not very good and it's a face presentation, even though it's just 9.5 centimeter, it may still get stuck. Okay, I'm talking about mento anterior, not mento posterior. Okay, so we'll discuss different <clears throat> definitions next. But remember, quick revision. Head, we just have one fixed transverse diameter, biparietal 9.5. What changes is the AP diameters from suboccipitopragmatic to occipitofrontal to vertico-mental to submentopragmatic. 9.5, 11, 14, and 9.5 again. So can you see what's happening? Only the AP diameter is changing. The transverse diameter or the engaging diameter is the BPD, which remains the same. Okay, I hope this point is very, very clear. The presenting diameter is the AP diameter. That is what changes depending on the attitude. The BPD, which is the transverse diameter, which is the engaging diameter remains the same. Okay, shall we move on? Okay. So now coming to some definitions which you should know on your fingertips. Exam may they'll ask you what is engagement, what is presentation, what is lie, what is attitude. We've talked so much about attitude, but how do you define these? What are the definitions? It's very important for you to know before we move on to mechanism of labor. Okay, so the first thing we will talk about is what is lie? Can anyone tell me what is lie? Okay, so lie basically is 
the long axis of the fetus with respect to the long axis of the mother. So if the fetus is like this, it is called a longitudinal lie because it is straight. Okay. If it is like this, it is called a transverse lie. And if it is like this, it is called an oblique lie. Okay. So you have longitudinal lie, transverse lie and oblique lie. This is simple, right? Next definition is presentation. What is presentation? Presentation basically means the part of the fetus which is occupying the lower pole of the uterus. So if it's a longitudinal lie, we can have two presentations. Either the head, that is cephalic presentation, or it is the breech, which is called as, or the uh, 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 bottom breech, or what is called as podalic presentation or breech presentation. So you can have cephalic and you can have podalic. This is in a longitudinal lie. In a transverse lie, what is the presentation? It is the shoulder. The shoulders are the presentation. Okay. Next comes presenting part. What do, you, what do you mean by presenting part? So we have presentation is the part occupying the lower pole of the uterus. Presenting part is the part that overlies the cervix. So when you do a per vaginal examination, the part that you're feeling is called the presenting part. Okay. So in a cephalic presentation, you we have different presenting parts depending on the attitude. So we'll first discuss attitude, then go back to presenting part. What is attitude? We've discussed this enough times. It is relationship of the fetal parts to one another. So in a cephalic presentation, we have flexion, we have deflection, we have partial extension, and we have complete extension. This is, uh, these are the different attitudes. In a breach, we have different attitudes depending on the flexion and extension of the knee and the hip joint. But I won't go into breach, we will concentrate only on cephalic. Okay, now in cephalic presentation, next we have presenting part. Okay, so presenting part basically is the part we're feeling overlying the cervix. Okay, the, the part felt on the presentation overlying the cervix depending on the attitude. Now in a well-flexed head, what is the presenting part? The presenting part is this part. This is the vertex. Okay, in a deflexed head also, we are feeling the vertex because the vertex is such a huge part of the fetus. So in a well-flexed head and in a deflexed head, the presenting part is the vertex. In a <clears throat> partially extended head, what is the presenting part? The presenting part is the, it is the bro. Okay, so remember bro is a presenting part. It is not a presentation. The presentation is cephalic. So it's a misnomer. We say face presentation, we, bro, we say bro presentation, but they're actually presenting parts. Okay, so we have bro is the presenting part in a partially extended head and in a fully extended head, the presenting part is the face. Okay, so we have vertex, vertex, bro and face. Okay, now, similarly, we have something called the denominator. What is denominator? Denominator basically is an arbitrarily chosen point, usually a bony prominence on the presenting part used to define position. And what is position? Position is the relationship of the denominator to different parts of the, of the maternal pelvis. Okay, don't get confused. It's actually very simple. I will just draw a table and, and simplify it again further for you. So denominator basically is a point on the presenting part used to describe position. So in a well flexed head presenting part was the vertex. What is the denominator? It is the occiput prominent part. It is the occiput. In a deflexed head presenting part is the vertex. And again, for sake of description, we still take the present the denominator to be the occiput. Okay, although it is it is behind, but still we for all descriptive practical purposes in a deflex head also the denominator is taken to be the occiput. In a partially extended head, the presenting part is the bro. What is the denominator? It is the frontum. This part, this bony prominence, is called the frontum. And in a fully extended head, the presenting part is the face. What do we use to describe position? We use the mentum. That is the denominator. The chin is used to describe position. Okay. And what is position? Position means different parts of the denominator in relation to the pelvis. So here we have the occiput. And if I put the occiput, say I put the occiput. Uh, one second. 
So this is my left, this is my right. Okay, and I put the occiput like this. Okay, so I don't know, not, not know how clear this is, but this is left occipital anterior. Okay, this is left occipital transverse. This is left occipital posterior. This is direct occipital posterior. This is right occipital posterior, right occipital transverse, right occipital anterior, and direct occipital anterior. Can you see direct occipital anterior, direct occipital posterior? So this is other, these are the different positions. If it was face, I would say this is left mental anterior, left mental transverse, and so on and so forth. So this is what the basic definitions are. Let me just write a very simplified table for you to understand better. Okay. So here we have, uh, one second, here we have presentation, here we have presenting part, here we have denominator or wait one second. Here we have attitude, or wait, uh, again, just give me a minute. Here we have attitude. Here we have presenting part. And here we have denominator. Okay. So the first one is, or all of them actually, we're talking about cephalic presentation. The first attitude we have is one of complete flexion. Okay. In complete flexion, the presenting part is the vertex and the denominator is the occiput okay and what is the presenting diameter in this we have the sub occipital bregmatic diameter the second is a state of deflection the attitude being deflexed or military attitude the presenting part is again the vertex the denominator is again the occiput and the di diameter is the occipital frontal the third one is partial extension. Okay, and here the presenting part is bro. Denominator is frontum. And the diameter is vertico-mental, which is the largest 14 centimeters. Okay, this was 9.5 centimeter, this is 11 centimeter. And the fourth is complete extension. And here we have face. And here we have mentum as the denominator. And here we have a sub mento pragmatic, which is again 9.5 centimeters. This table, students, is all that you need to know to understand the different. Present, presenting parts, denominators, and diameters of the fetus. It's as simple as this one table. All right. Okay. Now coming back to... Um, uh, now we'll discuss the last part of the topic, that is mechanism of labor. And the most common position is the left occipital anterior. Okay, so what is left occipital anterior? Just to do what the examiner will say, will we'll we'll give you the pelvis and skull and say, show me left occipital anterior. So be very confident, practice this. Most of you would have access to a pelvis and skull in your colleges. Practice this, okay? And practice with your friends, see how many, where you're going wrong. Okay, because unless you practice this multiple times, simply seeing my video will help. Yes, it will definitely help all of you. But until you do it yourself, okay, multiple times, you won't, you, till that time, you will still be nervous in the exam. Okay, so this is the head. This is a well-flexed head. Okay, so this is a occiput. This is the occiput. This is the left side. This is left occipital anterior position. Okay, now... What happens in um, mechanism of labor? There are several steps happening. The first step which happens is something called engagement, okay? Now, engagement usually happens when the head is deflexed. It's in the beginning. Most primary gravidas, the head will be engaged by term. In multigravidas, engagement happens at the onset of labor. That is only when contractions start. So, engagement basically is when the largest diameter of the transverse diameter of the skull that is the biparietal diameter 
this diameter crosses the pelvic inlet. So when it crosses the pelvic inlet, okay, when you do a PV, you will find you'll be able to feel the vertex or the head at the level of the ischial spine. So this is when engagement has happened. Okay, you can see better here. The largest transverse diameter has crossed the pelvic inlet. Okay, this is engagement. So this is the first step to happen. Along with the other steps, remember your books will give engagement followed by descent. But remember descent is the second step, yes, for your exam point of view. But also remember descent is a continuous process. Without descent, the, none of the other steps will happen, okay? So descent has to continuously happen. Descent means the, the baby moving down. And descent happens because of good uterine contractions mainly. And in the second stage of labor, by the pushing down efforts of the mother, okay? So descent is a continuous process. So engagement, then descent. Okay, and then what is the third step? So for all other steps to happen, the head has to now undergo this movement. So it usually engages as in a deflex position, but flexion has to happen for further movements to happen because if this does not happen, 11 centimeter will not become 9.5 centimeter. And in a small pelvis, this baby can get stuck. So flexion has to happen, okay? So you have engagement, descent, and flexion happening, okay? Now there's something called syncretism and asyncretism, which I forgot to mention. Syncretism is this. The head is entering symmetrically inside the pelvis. What is asyncretism? The head is entering asymmetrically, okay? That means it's sort of jiggling its way inside because the pelvis is very constricted or narrow and it has to enter like this or like this. That means not symmetrical, but asymmetrical. So if the anterior parietal bone is the presenting bone, it is called anterior asymptotism. And likewise, if the posterior bone is the presenting bone, it is called as posterior asymptotism. Now, after engagement, descent and flexion, what is the next thing that needs to happen? Now, remember what has happened. By now, the head has reached the plane of least pelvic dimension and is going towards the outlet. So what is happening? The inlet has, it's now changing from a transverse oval to a vertical oval. So the fetus also has to move from entering in the transverse plane. It has to move like this. So it's entered in LOA like this, but to come outside the outlet, it has to twist. And this twisting by 45 degrees is called as internal rotation. So 45 degree rotation, towards the anterior part or by one eighth of a circle is called as internal rotation. So I will repeat engagement, descent, flexion and internal rotation. Now by internal rotation, what is happening? The head has now reached the outlet. And can you see from a transverse, it has entered into the AP diameters of the outlet. So with internal rotation, the head has twisted like this over the shoulders. The shoulders haven't twisted. When the head moves only by 45 degrees, the head is just twisted over the shoulder. Okay, the shoulders haven't yet twisted. Then what happens? Then now at this point, clinically, you'll be able to see the head without separating the labia. You'll be able to see the head coming out. This is called the phase of crowning. And crowning is the phase just before extension. So crowning and then what happens? The occiput hinges against the pubic symphysis. And the head is born like this. So the head is born by a movement called extension. Why does it extend? Because the head was so constricted. It's in a confined space. Imagine if you're in a confined space and suddenly the world opens up to you. You will want to extend your head because you want to come out of the confines of the narrow pelvis. So the head is born by extension. So this is extension. Now, once the head is free, suppose your head was just twisted, you're in a confined space, suddenly you're free. So your head will automatically untwist. Okay, to untwist by 45 degrees because it was twisted by 45 degrees and this untwisting movement is called as restitution. Okay, so untwisting of the twisted head, which was internal rotation is called as restitution. And what happens after restitution is the head is now out, but what is inside? The shoulders, the shoulders which were entering as LOA also have to come in the same diameter at the outlet. So the shoulders twist. Now, if my shoulders move, my head will also move, right? So <clears throat> what happens, what we see is 
the head the head was born one second the head was born by extension then it untwisted and then you see the head moving by further 45 degrees this is called as external rotation which is nothing but internal rotation of the shoulders that is the shoulders are now entering and they have to twist by 45 degrees and this appears as a further twisting of the head by 45 degrees okay this is called as external rotation okay so what did we have we had we had engagement okay we had engagement then we had flexion then descent keeps happening okay and then we had internal rotation then we had the, had the head being borne by extension and then restitution and external rotation now once the head is freed the shoulders are inside now the shoulders hinge against the pubic symphysis and the shoulders are borne and then the entire head the entire fetus comes out okay so this is mechanism of labor in left occipital anterior it's actually very simple but you have to revise this multiple number of times before the exam okay that is what is important 